Great. Uh, so guys, I'm just Preet. Came back uh, middle of this week, uh, back from the Bay Area, and I went to see my folks in Chandigarh. On the way back, I was uh, in a train building this presentation, uh, and the lady, lady next to me just asked me, "Ab marketing karte hain kya?" And I had no answer to it. What do I do for life? What do I do for a living? Uh, how do I explain what entrepreneur could be in the morning, in the night? Uh, you know, takes up support calls in the middle of night, does a coding in the morning or sells to VCs, to, to uh, prospective people who want to join the company or to customers. Uh, so I've tried to capture a little bit of everything of what I've tried to do in a startup to build a global product out of India. Uh, the, the agenda goes about, talk about Druva uh, in brief, to talk about what we, do we do for a living. Uh, the key components of what we thought are the best uh, components to build a global product, including the, the product market fit, the differentiation, uh, how do we deliver these products, how do you choose the right go-to-market methods, uh, how do you really establish a brand, uh, a strong brand which, you, which people would pay premium for, uh, and then eventually, uh, how do you raise capital. Uh, it's a full spiral, uh, a process which you end up doing multiple times. You end up building a product, selling it, raising money. Uh, and just try to capture some of the learnings I've got uh, so far uh, doing everything in the last four years. So about Dhruva, it's a company founded about four years back uh, from Pune. Uh, we, we, we built something for the, for the endpoint space, the endpoint laptop, mobile space for enterprises, uh, what we call a unified product for endpoint prediction and management. Uh, we back up, we protect the data for mid to large enterprises uh, on the mobile devices and then eventually manage the data from an e-discovery archival standpoint. Uh, it's a pretty uh, niche market, about half a billion dollar in size. Uh, uh, we have a sizable market share, uh, about $70 million in investments with Sequoia and Nexus, and about 100 plus people. Uh, recently, Druva came into limelight uh, in the market when uh, uh, you know, we, we got Gartner, uh, made, it, made Gartner realize this is a, a category, uh, they would publish a market scope report, and we were named the, the leader in the market scope report, uh, and at the same time, we got a bunch of good awards, which established us that this is a space we completely own, and a battle which we have won on the technology front, and scaling up on the business front. A uh, couple of key good customer wins, we sell majority uh, to, to mid to large enterprises, uh, U.S. Army being one big customer, so is NASA, Tesla, uh, PwC is a pretty large customer, so is KPMG, uh, F-Secure, McAfee, a bunch of customers, about 1,400 customers at a million endpoint protected. Uh, we pretty much uh, uh, own the small market segment uh, from a product standpoint. Uh, so I think the, the, the key, the most important component to building a product which I'll start my journey from is how do you find the product market fit? Uh, and I strongly believe this is the most essential part of building a startup. Uh, if you get this wrong, uh, it's, it's tough. You may, and being an entrepreneur, you may be spending your, right, spending your time in the wrong place all the time and end up getting nowhere. So how do you get to a product which the market really needs? You, you sort of have to understand in a bigger market space, how do you create your own differentiation? Each market space evolves into disintegrates and integrate into multiple players. A car segment becomes a sedan and an SUV. It becomes a safer car, a driving machine, or a, you know, a, a more luxurious Lexus car. So you, you, each market evolves, disintegrates, and integrates into a smaller market segment. At any time, you've got to understand how do you create your own small differentiation. And they, they, for every single product, there's, a, there's essentially a price corridor. There's a, there's a space where you can see people may end up paying a, a good price for. And how do you associate, uh, it's pretty important for you to associate your attributes to that market corridor, your pricing corridor, so people you're targeting really pays for it. For Ford, it was the Model T which they launched. Their attribution was the car is not luxury, and you really get a car, which is an $1,800 car before, to about $200 uh, eventually when they launched the Model T in the market. And then came multiple cars which would break the segment further into uh, you know, a more colorful, but still a basic car by, by Chevy, and the market just went on. So for each market, you literally define certain differentiation. And my next two slides, I'll give some examples of how this is done. And the second most important question is to create this differentiation. 
but who would pay for it? Or, or is the differentiation, is the market, is the niche big enough? Uh, there was a pretty uh, cool uh, brand I came across in the US, which was a, a fake ice cream for the, for the dogs. And the, the, the banner was like, it's not an ice cream, but a dog will love it. The feeder doesn't care about what food you're serving him, right? He's going to go on this, the floor and eat everything which is on there. So the market has to be big enough for you to understand that the price corridor exists and people will pay for it. And, and the niche has to be big enough to get a significant market share. Eventually, the two other parameters that you really have to close, uh, control very effectively, one is called a barrier to entry. If you create this niche, if you understand this market exists, how can you protect it from multiple players who may enter the same market? How do you create barriers? If the barriers are not there, there are going to be multiple people doing the same thing and you, you lose the edge. Groupon is losing all their edge. So is Zynga because the barrier to entry is, is not so strong. Dropbox is able to maintain it because their barrier to entry is not technology. Their barrier to entry is the, the, the network effect they're building uh, through their file sharing. And eventually, the stickiness factor, people who stick to you, how often they come back and pay, uh, how, how, how much loyal are they, are they to, to actually stick on to your product uh, versus switching between different products if, if something doesn't work or if something better comes on. So the first example I take up to, to make sense of all this uh, gyan is uh, to take about red wines. Uh, you know, majority of us know there are regions, you know, Rioja, Bordeaux, you know, uh, different regions in the, in the market where you can, you, you understand grapes come from and you have Chardonnay, you have different grapes and everything, Merlot, Syrahs, but majority of us still buy the wine by the price tag. There are no brands in wines, there are no defined labels. And if you go and see wines, every single wine is trying to create a category of a niche where they're trying to define some very executive labels about how the wines have been made in oak, how they, they mix some sherry with the wine, some, some whiskey barrels or some different stuff. But the differentiation is, is too, too, uh, it's not too strong for you to literally go and buy a brand like you would buy for other spirits. So interesting case, case study came up uh, from a company called uh, uh, Yellowtail, Australian company, which figured out that in this model of differentiation, you can choose what to exclude, what to reduce, what to remove, and uh, what to improve and what to add. So in, in this typical space of red wines, they definitely worked on excluding sophistication and complexity. They wanted to make very clear distinction, no multiple regions, no multiple grapes, just Shiraz for, for, uh, for the red wine and, and Chardonnay for the white, as simple as that. Uh, they reduce the number of choice, they reduce the labels to just two labels, and pretty selective pricing for a person to just go in the store, see a yellow tail and buy it. Majority of wine drinkers are, want to really go for the, uh, for the expensive taste and the exotic wines, but there would definitely be a stronger, a niche, a not a majority, a shortcut, which somebody can create by, by, by doing a market differentiation around certain parameters, 80% people may not still like it, but 20% who would like your brand will love it. So they came, at, came ahead and, and improved simplicity by creating a simpler choice, simpler pricing, and then added fun and simpler labels. They, they started adding moods and the food you can add the wines with. So it made it very, very simple for a person, a party goer, to simply say, I'm going to get a Chardonnay or a, or a Yellowtail uh, Shiraz, that's it. He doesn't have to explain what region or what, whatever. So pretty good differentiation. And I think they rose from uh, uh, 4 million barrels to about 24 million barrels uh, pretty quickly in time. I think about four years in time. Uh, another example of how do you, a life example of how Druva built differentiation in the market, a pretty noisy space of, of backup. So we took up a, a pretty stab at the market when we started. We broke up every single feature in the market, what uh, existing market offers and backup from scalability to admin cost, so to administration of the product, to reporting, integration, deployment, and mobility, and vice versa. So, uh, so you sort, sort of, uh, we sort of understood that the, the net backup and the IBM and the Veritas are pretty strong on scal scalability or reporting or administration. It's tough to compete in those parameters. But when the big change from PC to laptop came, when a big change from laptop to tablet came, there was a strong differentiation around mobility, around ease of use. Where a company, we just simply want to buy a software for its viability. It's just going out there and downloading something and deploying it and, and, and make it very easy for the IT admin to manage the newer uh, endpoints. So we did not focus hard on, on all those big features of scalability to start with. We focused super hard 
on uh, you know deployment simplicity compared to a Veritas 4 GB deployment we had hardly a 50 MB deployment and the only product a person could download and deploy uh, we focus super hard on mobility focus super hard on usability and, uh, and non intrusiveness and the non intrusiveness seems simple how do you make the there was no 9 p.m. for backup on laptops anymore how do you make the business user completely unaware of backup we actually went ahead to file five patents on how you completely optimize on the one traffic how you optimize on, on the storage utilization how you optimize on CPU and, and thousand different things to get the get a not too fast not too slow backup ever working on any network and, and uh, that was the beginning of the dis dis disruption in this space. It took us about three years to make Garten and IDC realize the specialized category and then should be a, a, a different market focus. And I talk about how we achieve that as well. So once you have built this map of what you want to build in the mindset, the second step, important step is how do you build differentiation? How do you differentiate a product or just die explaining in, in multiple lines or paragraphs of how, how you're trying to build uh, and the next big app uh, without a strong differentiation and when I say differentiation I mean USP a strong unique selling proposition and majority of startups and majority of even large companies fail in explaining what the USP is right how do you differentiate how do you define attributes which can uh, which, which are suitable to your to your company right how it's unique how it's a sales proposition and what's a call to action right uh, a simple example is Coke saying uh, the, the, the real thing and then Pepsi differentiated saying if Coke is the real thing for the, for the, for the larger generation uh, we'll make something sweeter for the younger generation right so they differentiated when, when, when Mercedes was uh, the, 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 the best sedan a person could buy the most luxurious vehicle you could, you could, you could drive BMW had a strong differentiation on ultimate driving machine right a strong unique sales proposition in that message to help you have a simple call to action come and try the car and then you go around uh, one important people I, a lot of time see getting wrong is also getting the audience wrong uh, majority of you may end up doing something which your mom cannot understand and that's okay with that I, I still can't tell talk to my parents about what I'm building and how, how I'm different from the next big guys you literally have to understand the market which you're facing uh, understand uh, the segment which you're on target and just completely focus on that and, and just, just nail that market segment rather than being just too generic which everybody likes but nobody loves and eventually you got to carefully choose a competition I paid a pretty high price um, early on to learn this, this thing of, of what attributes you can actually associate yourself to and what attributes they cannot uh, they, they cannot be any salesforce.com they are pretty strong in sales CRM and, and unless a disruption happens Disruption could be a partner CRM or something else, but a strong differentiation is established and it's tough to break away unless you really create certain attributes which you can break away from. Right? So for, for my example, uh, I realized big time when I was building this backup business, I was too focused on consumer or enterprise. There are an influx of consumer apps from Mozi or Carbon, I turned this all the consumer problem. Enterprise is what I should have been focusing on, but I was tempted to go consumer route. And then I saw a very interesting product. I, I realized the most expensive uh, online backup product exists out there was from a bank called Wells Fargo. It's a pretty well-known bank in the U.S. And I was shocked. I, I literally tried to research how can Wells Fargo build an online backup product. And then I went ahead to read the case study uh, of the, when, how they tried to sell backups thinking that they have a lot of free space in the IT data center, they could start a backup business, and they failed. And then they associated the same product with different attributes to security and safety they rename the product from backup to saying secure vault just like you get a $55 vault in the bank to store your most important document pay $15 more have the same document scanned and stored online so I paying 10 times more cost for 10 times less storage for Wells Fargo a clear differentiation to an audience which really wanted the security of their most critical document so a, a solid association with attribute which 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 not been touched in the market and you can still ex ex uh, you know go on executing so how did Drua uh, you know and then of course pricing becomes an interesting point as well uh, and I think I'll circle back when I show the next chart uh, so Drua tried hard to differentiate early on there was Dropbox box in the market there was more of file sharing and, and then endpoint backup space was full of semantic connected and other products so we slowly we slowly uh, and, and steadily 
attributed our, our sales process to purely focus on endpoints, purely focus on end price, and the and the price option that you gave uh, in terms of the, the total cost of ownership. A solution in the end was about three times more expensive than semantic, but we had the solid non-intrusive storage saving features, which a person would really pay uh, you know uh, a premium for. Uh, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time explaining this because the audience may not be right uh, for this exact niche. Uh, but this, this, this differentiation is what we really helped us to say, hey, we're not trying to be file sharing. Uh, we are the backup company. And eventually, when we build a strong backup base, when we, we were the preferred choice for any backup uh, uh, buyer in the space, we slowly added those features uh, to do certain bit of file sharing. When, when a lot of content got backed up, we offered e-discovery services. Hey, you got all the data backed up. We'll offer a legal team to search the data to, to build up a legal case. Or let us archive the data for you. Or let us help you share the data for you. Uh, slowly, 18 to 20% of business started coming from uh, the other market segments. And now we again pivoted to say we are the unified solution. We're the only solution in the market which could give a, the best of the breed data protection and then the user focus collaboration in the same suite. And it took off again for us. We signed the first million dollar deal in the, on this vision uh, some time back. So, so this took off. On the pricing piece, it was again very critical to how, how do you price this, this, this complicated thing. And the only thing I would say is nobody wants to buy the most expensive one on the menu and also the, not, not the least expensive one on the menu. You always want to have the second costiest one on the menu, even though it may be the most, cost, most expensive in the market. You always do comparative selling, comparative buying. So there's a price corridor which, which may have a, a, a least expensive product and the most expensive one. And the second costliest wine, creating that mindset, sometimes is really a win-win uh, for a startup. So we launched a solution uh, when Symantec was $24, at $35, $45, and eventually $55, had no competition at all. Eventually, we went to $85, made a big mistake, had a drastic cut down on our sales, and then we understood the, 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 the philosophy that, hey, we can't define a market being a startup being the most expensive wine. So we created a secondary, a secondary category called a pro edition of a product, much cheaper to compete with semantic, and then kept, kept the most expensive one in the menu, just from a comparison point of view. So a lot of people came on the ego, on the readiness, bought a different product. They were no different, but in, in the end, we made a lot more money. So uh, eventually, the, th the third most important part of this, this entire spiral is to deliver the product and the lean startup way. It's a pretty important book. Uh, majority of you must have read already. How do you build a, the, the minimal viable product? And it's pretty essential. The most important thing, uh, and I'll probably cover this thing pretty fast because I'm assuming a lot of people will just have already read the book. If not, uh, they would if, if not already. Uh, the, the biggest mistake people still do is they trust the customer for next feature to build. Customers really don't understand uh, what feature to build. They are just there to buy into your vision. You have to explain your vision and get their buy-in. You don't have to get to them to build the next feature. Microwave took 40 years to take off because it was being built for a complete different need of what it would eventually evolve to be. Nobody could actually define what the iPad would be or an iPhone would be. You literally should have a solid vision, a strong conviction, a strong leadership trait that, hey, I just want to build a product like this and test the customers for their buy-ins. They're not there to they build it for you. They're just to validate your vision. And eventually, you're not there to build features. There are bigger companies out there. Uh, there's a pretty interesting book again called Innovator Zalema, which you should, uh, again, read up. They are the bigger companies who have much bigger uh, you know, product marketing team, Microsoft, IBM, they'll build the best feature that market needs. You're not there to build features. They're there to build differentiation. Majority of what you'll build we dislike by the, by the majority of people. 80% of people will say, hey, we're not going to buy your stuff because this is not what you asked for. But you're not there to solve that market. You're creating this new wine brand, which only the fun-loving party goes want to have, and you carve over the market. You're not there to compete with IBM head-on or Microsoft head-on. A classic example in, in, covered in the book also is the disk drive market. Disk drive, nobody could beat IBM for 30 years. Customer will go on saying, I want the better disk, faster, more dense, and uh, you know more reliable. And nobody could beat IBM 30 straight years. Nobody could build a faster, more reliable, and more dense disk. And then came Seagate, a smaller disk. Customer said, hey, that's faster? No. Is it, is it more dense? More GBs per, per inch? No. Is it more reliable? No. I don't need it. But that does create a completely new market called the PC market. A differentiation happened. Majority of customers did not like it. 
And then the differentiation became a trend. You, you had five and a half inch thing, there's a three and a half inch, and then again two and a half in OSSDs, which are much smaller, much faster, and a different differentiation altogether. So differentiation, once the period, can also become a trend. But your best bet in a startup is to create differentiation, not create features. And then eventually, uh, same point, features could be distracting. We have, we, have, we have said strictly to our product management team, just go to customers, nod ahead, come back, tear it off. You're not there to listen for customers, what features to build. Have a solid vision, don't build features, build a solid differentiation, which could just you know, completely have you, uh, leap, leap, uh, you know, jump apart the competition, you know, completely uh, go on a tangential dimension. So once you build this product, uh, you know, and this is a showcase of how we build the product, a completely different interface compared to uh, what you would come across from Microsoft or Symantec or any other product, a completely web-driven, a fully uh, web 2.0 UI, which we built to completely end-to-end -end manage the user data, where they're based, what they're backing up, what they're doing, how to predict data and, and everything, and a super high focus on mobility uh, as well. So going further, the next important point uh, is how do, you re how do you choose the right go-to market? And, and I call this hunting for deers. And, and, uh, and the reason is, uh, majority of us don't have the luxury of having the market local. The Indian market for enterprise at least, or even for a majority of services, even consumer, doesn't exist. There's no single CIO in this room or whatever does buy from a startup. So this doesn't exist. So if the local market doesn't exist and you have to uh, support a remote market, the choice of customer, is it too small to be a rabbit, too large to be an elephant, or just a right $25,000 deer you want to hunt, defines how you go to market. Rabbits are too, too small to scale. You have to hunt a thousand of them to become a big company. Elephants too large to get to. You need to build a solid sales team to get, get to elephants. The deers are the most beautiful element to, uh, uh, animals to hunt in this market for a startup. And, and you've got to choose carefully that you are, you know, what's a, how do you define your product? Is it a product a must to have versus a good to have? In our case, you're not selling a CRM, which is a must to have for a, to run a business. It is good to have as a backup, as an insurance policy. So how do you find this right deers where they hang around to hunt them? Is it, is it hunting where you go on a jeep and start hunting deers? Or is it fishing where you wait for the deer uh, to, or, or a fish to raise its hand and say, I need a backup? Uh, we figured out that a, co a company needs a backup to the point he buys it is pretty small. But educate them to, the, to, to, them to need an endpoint backup is pretty, pretty weak. So we build the entire model around fishing and not around going on a safari to hunt. And, and a clear differentiation we try to build versus competition is to understand, do you want to go enterprise versus mid-market, which is again elephant and deer philosophy, to go direct and channel, do you want to control the entire process and, and build a mathematical model yourself, or go in a, in a channel-based approach to, 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 to kill this market? And eventually, how do you market? Do you market this cold calling, or do you, uh, do you build a, a very highly marketing-based model? It's tough to answer this question in a generic manner, but we focus very hard on, on direct market. We, we did not work with partners for a long time uh, because we really wanted to, we were, we were, we were phenomenally focused just to uh, exactly monitor and track every single action a customer takes from website to final purchase. We know every, every single time he hits a website, we see score him, we rank him, we deliver different emails, we deliver different content. We do exactly final management of a, of a customer from end to end point of view. So we wanted to control the method and he went a, a strong marketing and a strong direct focus way. And this for this for Druva doesn't mean it will hold uh, right or wrong for you guys as well. Uh, so eventually the next step, the next big step, uh, once you've defined this go-to market, is also to, to make some noise, to, to, create some, to create some brand awareness. And that's pretty critical. And I, and I completely, uh, when, I, when I first traveled to Bay Area, there's a first distinction I saw. Uh, uh, you know, if you, if you see a presentation from an Indian startup versus an American startup, you will see the Indian startup talks about the first five slides, how the culture is really good, how, you know, how they're building the next best product, and, and a good American product will, will sell you crap, but sell you in a really good package manner. Uh, and, and technology doesn't necessarily always sell, and you've seen multiple times with sun going down or, or multiple things just happen uh, around technology companies. So how do you really uh, create the brand awareness? First of all, the first thing you've got to do is understand the channel, who your influencers are, who your moves and shakers are. You've got to map them. So for Drova, we literally uh, figured out that there is this concept of separation of church and state. 
where there, there's this bloggers and, and uh, there's uh, this analyst uh, which want to separate themselves from being, uh, uh, you know, uh, from being paid to do much of stuff. But in a larger extent, unfortunately found it's not true. Uh, we, we found a lot of people, a lot of good quality bloggers, a lot of good quality journalists were pretty good in maintaining the stance about not taking any feedback, but there's a bigger market, a bigger influencer market, uh, which really could be incentivized to work in your favor. And uh, there's a famous saying that I like strawberries, my fishes don't like them, they like worms. So what mo may motivate one person may not motivate another person. Uh, uh, and motivation may not just simply mean bribing somebody. Motivation may mean how do you really ha get Gartner to create a category? How do you start a dialogue around a new differentiation? Is it to literally involve and, 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 and get more time with the analyst? Is it to sponsor some, some, some symposiums? Is it to understand if they can sponsor a, uh, a paper from IDC, a competing analyst firm? Or is it to give the sales rep the number, the Gartner sales the number of a competitor? So multiple people pay Gartner to create this dialogue and a category. So there are multiple uh, influencing means a startup has to understand and deploy. But the, 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 the starting point is understand who are the core influencers and who are the core people. And don't get me wrong, this, this is not, uh, you know, uh, paying for uh, what you want to get. It's, it's more like understanding the incentives. Uh, it's, it's as simple as when you go and sit with a with the media person, be respectful. Don't start the pitch of I'm Drova and I'm so and so. Ask him, hey, what are you writing about? How can I help you to write a better article? Is there a story coming up and I can plug in? And be open about it. And that's in incentivizing sometimes goes a long way than just being blunt about how you're the best company out there. And then the, the third thing goes about, trust me, I'm lying. There's a pretty interesting book called the same title. You should read about that as well. It's a good marketing book. It's about how do you create news a majority of time when you're competing with, a, with the competition and they may be c coming up with some ideas. Uh, what you may market and what you may build could be completely different things. You just have to know the art of what's sellable and, and what is the audience ready to hear from you rather than what you are ready to tell them. And understand this pitch uh, before you launch anything and, and, and time it pretty well. Um, and the last part, I'm, I'm rushing a bit, I'm just concerned about time here and I'm happy to take up more and more questions as I end my presentation. The last part is raising capital. You know, how do you understand the, the dark side, how it operates and everything. So, so, so you, again, just like, just like uh, a blogger, an analyst, you got to, got to understand how the VC operates. You know, what are they interested in? Uh, you know, why would they only fund a business plan 20x uh, with a 20 years growth promise? It makes sense. You know, they have limited time. They may have limited bandwidth to invest in few startups, and they want to give, get a better sense of market. You know, every VC uh, may have a different win to loss ratio. They may have a different uh, risk to reward ratio in every fund cycle. And you got to understand, uh, you know, uh, how their fund operates. Uh, you know, and, and how much risk reward they have. Uh, you know, a lot of VCs have outliers. Uh, you know, uh, Sequoia India versus Sequoia US versus completely differently. A Sequoia US has outliers like the Dropbox or, or YouTube in every fund cycle, which pays off the risk for a majority of the firms that they are much more risk taking in certain manners. And, and, and the outliers are smaller in, in some of the other cases. So you got to understand these things pretty well and map yourself to the right firm, the right partner who may understand your value prop and you may understand his value prop and, and have, have a good match. Uh, he's paying for his own growth, he's paying for his own growth of his own fund, and you're paying for your own startup. Uh, the interests are aligned, but still there's a, there's a good overlap for you to understand uh, and go along it. And eventually, things to watch out for, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, uh, you, you're always tempted to get a best valuation. I think the valuation is the last thing a, a founder should worry about. Uh, you know, A, they are, it's not important at all. You're, you, you're setting up sell for a, even a higher valuation the next round. Um, uh, and B, uh, you know, there are multiple ways a VC can trick you anyways, right? Uh, including liquidation preferences and ESOPs and thousand different things. So, so you, you've got to understand that what's really valuable for you is the partner, is the firm, is the brand name. And, 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 and even your own personal sake, what is an exit for you? And are you setting, up, setting yourself up for a too high an exit? Uh, any any person who comes in at one round has to have a 4x uh, growth in, f in, the next, in the next milestone. If you have too high a valuation, you may be setting a barrier for you for, the, for your own exit. 
So it may be a blessing in disguise to go for a lesser valuation sometimes, but go for a better partner and ask questions. Don't be afraid of asking questions. Hey, how, how many startups have you funded in my space? How well do you understand my space? Is it a good fit for us? It's a dating process. Don't be afraid of asking the right questions. And then eventually, uh, you know, use capital judiciously. There's a, there's a big phenomenon in the Bay Area to just burn the cash. Uh, about four to five years back, uh, getting the sales and marketing right was uh, the big thing. You, you literally could build a product. Um, they were, there was wisdom around building a product and understanding the customer pretty well, but sales and marketing was a tricky situation. Thanks to internet, thanks to all this uh, you know, social media, uh, I think money can, can make your life a lot more easier to, uh, to, buy, to get your buy-in in a, in a mass uh, sales and marketing process. I think what's, what's, what's a good reversal of process is, is what I've realized is that it takes three years to build a product. Right, any product, consumer company or, or an enterprise product, and there's no way you can you can speed it up, and and uh, that's the most interesting point part. You have to literally carefully build, uh, and at the, at the at that stage, be focused on using the money very carefully. Invest into those fe features and areas you really want to invest into, and once you hit the stage where you completely build a mathematical model of what's the cost of opportunity for me. Uh, for a consumer business, it's cost of cost of a visitor, a price of a visitor, a value of a visitor, an enterprise, the cost of a customer, a, co a value of a customer, a CAC, LTV, all kind of model. Once the math is nailed, uh, the science is there, and the artist is sucked out to to make completely a, a mathematical model. Just blow out, blow it out. You're putting a lot of money. Until then, just hold your horses and use the money pretty effectively and uh, and, and effective uh, and, and carefully. Uh, that's all. It's all from my side.